morning we turn to the Word of God and have three short meditations upon which the truth that God conveys to us is based. Jesus' resurrection changes things, changes everything. This morning we talk about the fact that Jesus died and he came back to life. We call that the resurrection. What does it change? Well, everything. But let's talk about some specifics. The first Bible reading that we have takes us to a man named Saul. But before we talk about him, just to get us ready to hear about what happened to Saul, does anyone know who that is? Does anyone know who that is? Huh? Am I too old? Am I showing movies that are too old? Come on, it can't be true. Who is that? That's Megamind. Ever seen that movie, Megamind? It's a movie about Megamind, who has a Megamind, and he uses his brains and has gadgets and gizmos, but he's the villain. He's the bad guy, at least at first. He uses his brain and his gadgets and gizmos to do crimes, to be the bad guy. Then he meets a girl, wants to impress said girl, and a real villain shows up, and pretty soon Megamind turns from being the bad guy to being the good guy. Changes. But in the end, he doesn't really change. Still has his mega mind, still has his gadgets, still has his gizmos, but what he uses them for isn't to commit crimes, but to help others to save the day. Now again, that's mega mind. That's a movie, but when we think about what happened to Saul in real life, it's pretty spectacular. I'm going to read to you from Acts chapter 9. Now again, as this, we try to figure out ways to help children and parents worship, I've replaced the readings on the screen with pictures. If you want to follow along with the readings, you can use your bulletin, but on the screens will be pictures about our Bible story. This is what happened to Saul. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any men or women belonging to the way, he might bring them to Jerusalem as prisoners. As he went on his way and was approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? He replied, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you need to do. The men traveling with him stood there speechless. They heard the voice, but did not see anyone. They raised Saul up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see anything. They took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. For three days he could not see, and he did not eat or drink. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord told him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. In fact, at this very moment he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and lay his hands on him so that he can regain his sight. Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many people about this man and how much harm he did to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. The Lord said to him, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the people of Israel. Indeed, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Ananias left and entered the house. Laying his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, whom you saw on your way here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. 
and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul stayed with the disciples in Damascus for several days. Immediately, he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and said, Isn't this the one who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? Didn't he come here for this very purpose, to bring them as prisoners to the chief priests? But Saul continued to get stronger and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So you see, Saul was a very special man. Saul had many talents and abilities. He had a drive that was different than all other people. He was willing to do things that no one else really wanted to do. He's willing to travel to far off places. He was courageous. He was bold. He was fearless. But as we see, he used all of that for the purpose of trying to stop people from believing in Jesus. He would go to far off places to imprison people. He was courage, courageous and boldless to confront people, to fight against this teaching of Jesus whom he thought was false. That changed, didn't it, when Jesus appeared to him. Now he knew that Jesus was the truth, the Son of God. And that changed Paul, certainly, Saul, but it didn't. It changed really his purpose in life. Saul was still the same man. He still had the same gifts and abilities, but now he was not going to use them to stamp out Christianity, but to spread it. He would travel to far off places to teach people of Jesus. He would be bold, bold and courageous, willing not to throw people in prison, but for himself to be thrown into prison. He would use his drive and his passion to serve his Lord. Now again, what is this all having to do with us today? Well, in the end, we have to say the same about ourselves, don't we? God makes each of you unique. You all have different gifts and abilities. How many are you good at sports? Well, some that aren't. How many are really smart? Well, there are some that aren't. How many are shy? How many are outspoken? We all have our different gifts and abilities, and many times we use them to serve ourself, serve sin. But knowing that we have a Savior who died for us and came back to life, it's an opportunity for us to use those gifts, not just for ourselves, but to use them for our Savior. May the Lord Jesus give us His Holy Spirit so that we can use our gifts and abilities to serve Him, just like Saul did. Let's respond to that by hearing our children sing a couple of songs for us.
Second reading is taken from the book of Revelation, a book in which God allows the Apostle John and us through his words to see things, to see things that are real, but that we cannot see right now. Before we get to that and why Jesus' resurrection changes things, I'll show you a few pictures. You tell me if it's good or bad. Good or bad? Good, unless you're trying to lose weight, and then it's bad. Good or bad? Storms, pretty scary. Unless you need water, I guess. Oh, the cuddly bear. A cuddly teddy bear is good. Real bear, bad, right? How about this one? It's a lamb. What about this one? That's the Lamb, isn't it? That's the Lamb of God on the cross. Is that a bad picture, a sad picture, or a good one? How about this one? That's the Lamb of God. He's being buried into a grave. Is that good or bad? Again, we're so often in life tend to look at things that seem to be so sad and so bad. People grow sick. People have hard lives, people die, and we don't know what to think of it. Well, that's true of Jesus, but let's listen to a vision that God allows us to see the truth of what happened to Jesus and how Jesus, although these things might seem sad or bad, because of what happened, they're actually good, and they change everything for us. Let's read from Revelation chapter 5. This is what God says. Ready? I looked. And I heard the voice of many angels who were around the throne and around the living creatures and the elders. Their number was ten thousand times ten thousands and thousands upon thousands. With a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing." I also heard every creature that is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders bowed down and worshipped. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What did you see in that vision? What did God allow us to see about Jesus? Yes, he died. That may make us sad for a moment. Yes, he was placed in the grave and make us sad for a moment. But where is he now? He's in heaven. And who is he surrounded by? Angels. People who have gone to heaven before us. He's in glory now. So we don't need to see Jesus on the cross and be sad, because in the end that was good. That was how he won our salvation. We don't need to see Jesus buried in the grave and be sad, because is he still in a grave? No, he's alive. And that not only changes things for Jesus, but it changes things for us as well. Because one day, when we live long enough, what will eventually happen to us? We will die. We'll be placed into a grave. But where will our souls go? We'll go to heaven to be with Jesus. And one day Jesus will come to this earth and raise our bodies back to life. Won't it be wonderful to be in heaven with Jesus, to be with the angels, to be with all those people who have gone before us? It will be wonderful. Let's sing about that vision in our next hymn, hymn number 885, There is a Higher Throne.
last reading is the gospel reading, the words and works of Jesus Christ recorded for us. Jesus' resurrection changes everything. I want to read this for you. Something amazing happens. This happened shortly after Jesus died and rose back to life. This is what we read in John chapter 21. After this, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. This is how he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They replied, we'll go with you. They went out and got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus was standing on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus called to them, Boys, don't you have any fish? No, they answered. He told them, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast the net out. Then they were not able to haul it in because of the large number of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard, It is the Lord. He tied his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. When they stepped out on land, they saw some bread and a charcoal fire with fish on it. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you just caught. So Simon Peter climbed aboard and hauled the net to land, full of large fish, 153 of them. Yet even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come, eat breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and also the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Christ. So what amazing thing happened? Okay, they caught fish in a net. That's amazing. No, it wasn't the amazing thing that I'm talking about. Jesus appearing to his disciples, that was amazing because he died, but he came back to life. No, that's not what I'm talking about. You know what is amazing? Breakfast. Jesus made his disciples breakfast. And something wonderful happened. You see, this is the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples. Do you remember the other two times that Jesus appeared? Where were they? They were hiding behind locked doors because they were afraid. What were they afraid of? Yeah, the enemies of Jesus. But you know what else they probably were afraid of or embarrassed of? What they did to Jesus. What did the disciples do to Jesus when he was arrested? What did, he, what did they do to him? Huh? Anton? They ran away from Jesus. They left him. Peter, especially, what did Peter do to Jesus? He not only ran away, but then he kind of tried to figure out things that were going on when Jesus was on trial. And people asked him, do you know Jesus? You're one of his disciples. What did Peter do? He said, I don't know Jesus. I don't know him at all. And he was close enough to Jesus, and Jesus was close enough to him to hear Peter say that. Jesus looked at Peter. Peter realized what he did. He ran away crying. So what is amazing about this breakfast? The first two times that Jesus appeared to his disciples, he had to go to them. He had to appear to them, right, behind locked doors. They probably were afraid or embarrassed about what they did. But what's different about this time? Jesus makes breakfast. What's different is that Jesus stands on the shore and what happens? Peter jumps out of the boat and swims to Jesus. Goes to Jesus. Do you think Peter was afraid anymore to go to Jesus? Do you think Peter was embarrassed or ashamed anymore? No. The Easter truth was finally starting to sink in, wasn't it? They were no longer afraid, but they rejoiced to be with Jesus, and they ate breakfast. Again, why do we have this as part of our celebration of Easter? Are there times when we maybe are afraid to go to Jesus? Absolutely. Your parents and adults know this very well. 
when we sin against God, when we've failed Him, or we're ashamed, too ashamed to go to Jesus, right? My dear friends, Jesus died to take your shame away. Jesus came back to life to prove that you don't need to be afraid to come to Him. So don't ever be afraid to come to Jesus. Don't ever be afraid to go to your Lord. Don't ever stop yourself and say, I just can't do it because God went through all of this, suffering, dying, come back to life so that you could be his own. And may God give us strength to continue doing that as we worship him. Let's sing about the great gift of our Savior Jesus Christ in our next hymn, 519, There is 